you how we send out samples to our outside lab. We use Antec Diagnostics, and there's a little box here to fill in all the patient's information. And then they have tests listed. Um, you always clearly mark and circle the test that you're going to be using. If the test is not here, we do have a book that they provide that has test codes that you'll put up here in the corner and star. Um, so always want to make sure that the patient's name is legibly written on the, the paper and is always written on the sample as well. So we're sending out a stool sample for an ovum parasite. So the patient's name is on there and the account number and the test that we're going to be running. And then we're going to fill out this form to um, match what we're going to be sending out. So you put the date and clearly write in the patient's name. And then after we're done doing this, we're going to stick it in the bag and it goes in the fridge until the lab actually picks the test up. Canine, you always put the doctor's name that is ordering the test. So when it comes back, you know whose, um, whose patient it is. And then you always mark the test that you're going to be running. And then you stick it. And um, one copy of it goes to them, and one copy you keep here for your own records. Now it goes in the fridge. Okay. So. so this is our microscope. Um, so with a microscope has eyepieces, um, and then it has the lenses over here, um, which are the different um, powers. Um, so what you want to do um, on a regular basis is basically um, we have lens paper that you use. Um, this is what you want to use to always clean um, the different um, power um extremities and the eye pieces because you don't want to scratch anything. Um, it's a pretty expensive piece of equipment. Um, so with the oil immersion ones, um, you know, you can definitely uh, find that there's a, a, a large amount of oil on it afterwards. So after every um, usage, you should clean each lens piece. Um, you lightly um, wipe the area. Um, and then you can actually remove the eyepieces. You want to make sure that you're very careful with them. And you can also do the same thing on the inside of the um, uh, eyepiece and the outside. Um, and then you can also clean the rim over here as well. And you can clean the stage um, with a little bit of alcohol. Um, and um, then we have our controls over here. Um, and you can just wipe everything down and dust it. I'm going to show you how we do a Giardia ELISA test. Um, so it comes, they're, they're called snap tests because when you actually put the solution in, you have to snap the piece down so that the test starts to run. Um, so we're going to do a Giardia. So it comes with these little sticks and these tests are always refrigerated. You leave them out until they get um, room temperature. So what you're going to want to do is just put a little bit of stool on the tip of the um, Q-tip that's attached to the solution. Um, you want to make sure there's no chunks on there. You're going to stick it back in. Put the lid back on this because this has to be going to the lab. And you basically um, move this piece back and forth so that it snaps. And you squeeze it to put the solution into the vial so that it mixes with the stool. You want to make sure you get it mixed really well. And then it basically sucks all the solution back up to, into here where um, it's now mixed with the fecal material. And you're going to completely um, empty this little area into the snap test. 
Okay, and then you allow it to run down, and once it reaches this little dot, you're gonna snap it down, and we're gonna start the timer. You wanna make sure you put a lot of force on it so you get it to snap all the way down the first time. Okay, so the circle's completely filled. So you snap it down, you start the test, it runs for eight minutes. Um, there's um, a, con a control dot. If it's negative, it will have an additional dot over here. Um, if it's positive, the dot will all, there will be a dot over here. The control dot will show up over here. We also have little stickers for our files that has the patient's name um, and the results and whether or not we're going to be sending out a, um, a stool sample to the outside laboratory. So when that's done, we just will um, monitor the results and just record them and put them in the file. So the results are almost done. We have two seconds left. Um, there we go. And as you can see, there's only one dot. This is the control dot. So the Giardia test is negative for Giardia. So we're going to be taking an ear cytology on Francis. He has um, really, really bad ear issues. Um, they're really inflamed a lot of the time and have a lot of yeast in them. Um, so we're going to take the Q-tip and try and get a really good sample. So there's lots of gooey stuff on there and we're going to place it on a slide. You're going to roll it and with the ear cytologies you heat fix them before you stain them. There's our sample. Mm -hmm. So we're going to get our slide ready for um, the um, ear cytology evaluation. So first you want to always heat fix the slide so that when you stain them, the sample doesn't come off of the slide. And you're going to wipe the bottom of the slide because the flame leaves some residue behind. Now we're going to go ahead and stain, and you leave the slide in each solution for about 10 seconds. The first one is the fixative. And then we have the stain solution. stain solution. And then after you're done staining, you um, rinse the slide off slightly and then you would allow it to air dry and then we'll discuss how to look at it under the microscope. So I'm just going to lightly rinse it off. and then we'll allow it to dry. Okay, good. We're gonna evaluate our slide now. Um, basically what you're looking for is bacteria or yeast. Bacteria are little circles and the yeast are little uh, peanut shaped structures. Um, so you always start in the lowest power, um, which is the 48th power and make your way up. Um, you'll be looking at the results in the oil immersion um, power. Uh, you want to make sure you focus in each power before you move up. And the dial to focus is over here um, on the right. And then we're going to place some oil on the slide. doesn't really matter how much you put on, usually like one or two drops. And you count basically um, per high power field how many of each um, you may see, whether it's bacteria or yeast. 
and you let the doctor know. So they know um, basically how bad the infection is and they can place the patient on the proper medication. And it looks like this patient in particular has um, a lot of yeast going on. Um, sometimes when they have a really bad yeast infection you can actually smell smell it from their ear. Um, and that's basically it. Okay. Before doing a necropsy you want to make sure that um, you're properly protected. Um, so your hands, your eyes, your mouth, um, you want to always wear a gown. Um, some clinics have disposable ones, unfortunately we do not. So you want to make sure that you cover um, your scrubs and um, button up. Most, um, some necropsies, if they're preserved, um, they would be preserved in um, formalin. So you want to make sure you don't want to splash any formalin on yourself. Um, you want to protect your eyes from the fumes. So we have goggles. Um, and then you always want to properly place the mask so you cover your nose and mouth just in case there's any splashing as well. And then of course um, always wear gloves when touching um, um, any patient for a necropsy um, just in case they have any type of diseases um, just in general for cleanse purposes. You always want to make sure that you're properly attired for um, this kind of procedure. Okay, um, we're going to do a necropsy, short necropsy on the cat. 15 year old cat that presented for um, diabetes and non healing wounds. Um, we were suspect suspicious of um, Cushing's disease, so we're just going to try to take a look at the adrenal glands in this cat. Um, Christy's helping you, we're just going to position her a little bit different. <clears throat> Usually there's more involved in a necropsy, we're just going to look at the abdomen this time. This patient was euthanized yesterday. into the abdomen you will look for free fluid so far I cannot see So we're going to submit some a piece of tissue. You always want to take about um, the thickness of your pinky finger and get a good slice. So let's say we need to submit a sample of liver. So we're going to cut a piece here. If 
you want to submit these, you usually slice them about pinky size and diameters. Hey, did you just get the picture of what I just sent you? No? Oh, okay. So let me ask you a quick question, because I'm doing a, um, I'm actually, uh, I'm actually doing a, uh, a So depending on where we have pathology, if it's, you know, submit multiple samples, in this case, um, this cat looks more, it has diffused disease, so it's not a particular area of the spleen I want to submit. So we'll just submit one of these slices, and um, we want to put them in formaldehyde <coughs> and the cutainer. This container is a little small. It's small. We need to usually submit this in a container that contains about 10 times more fluid than the actual tissue. But um, depending on what tissue you want to submit, you take a certain piece and sum it up, and that's it. Taking um, a sample for a rabies suspect, you want to make sure that you're also properly attired. You want to wear a gown, a mask, um, goggles, uh, gloves, of course. Um, a lot of the times, um, the doctors will actually do the severing of the skull. Um, they want someone experienced that knows how to cut properly so you send the right amount. Um, basically you're sending the patient's entire head um, to the laboratory. You sever from the midpoint um, the base of the skull between the shoulder blades. Um, when you're packaging the sample you're going to put it in a in a container um, that's tightly sealed. You're not supposed to put it in any formulin. They can't um, do the test if it's in formulin. And you don't want to um, ref uh, freeze it because if you freeze it, then it delays the test um, because I have to thaw it out. Um, so you want to keep it cold um, before you send it out to them. It needs to be cold and refrigerated um, and before it being sent to the laboratory. Okay, we're getting ready to start a... Prep for vaginal cytology, we're actually going to use a sterile culturette swab. We're going to moisten it with a little bit of saline. And then insert in the vagina. Expose the vagina. Gonna insert in the vagina. That's large. Point up and go around. Okay, and get us a nice cytology. There you go, Chris. And now I'm going to um, place this onto a slide so we can look at it under a microscope. Make sure the slide is nice and clean, and you're gonna roll it the sample onto the slide. And you always make sure that you label the slides with the patient's name and where it came from. Okay, we're good. Okay, so we're going to stain the vaginal cytology slide that we did. Um, we're going to use the modified rights. You're going to leave the slide itself in there for about 10 seconds. going to rinse it off a little bit and allow it to dry. Um, what we're going to be looking for on the slide itself are um, cornified cells. Um, as the days progress, they increase about 10%, and when it actually reaches full estrus, it'll be um, 90 to 100% cornified cells. You want to zoom in here? Okay. So we're on the 100th power at the moment, and we were just looking at the cells. Um, and it looks like this particular dog was in pro estrus when we took the, um, the sample. There's four stages of estrus. Um, in each stage, when you look at it under the microscope, you're going to want to look for different types of cells, um, potentially erythrocytes, neutrophils, 
Um, so in um, anestrus, um, it's predominantly non-cornified cells. Um, and you may find some neutrophils in there as well. Um, in proestrus, there's early proestrus and um, late proestrus. Um, in early, you're going to find high erythrocytes with um, basal cells or parabasal cells. Um, and then in late, um, they're nearly all um, epithelial cells with small numbers of neutrophils. When you get into estrus, um, they're all uh, cornified and nuclear cells. There's no neutrophils and small amounts of um, erythrocytes. When you get to diestrus, um, they're, there's, um, they're non cornified squamish epithelial cells with an increase of neutrophils um, and generally you don't find any erythrocytes in diestrus. We're going to get blood from ethyl for our recipient sample. And usually you need about 3 cc's to fill both syringes. Again, we're going to put one part of the blood in the lavender top and part of the blood in the serum separator. And you allow the serum separator to clot before spinning it down, usually about 10 to 15 minutes. And you rock it back and forth so it doesn't clot. And then you put her name on the vials as well. Okay. Take some blood from Ruby for our donor cells. Part of the blood Thank you. into a lavender top so that it doesn't clog. You rock it back and forth. And then some in a serum separator. And then you label it um, with donor and her name. That's it. Good. We have um, her name on both of the tubes. Uh, Ruby's the donor. Um, so the serum separator you have to allow to clot before you spin it down. So the blood's completely clotted right now. So we're going to put both of these samples into the centrifuge and spin them down. So come closer. So when you put things into the centrifuge, you always have to balance them out. So we have um, a serum separator filled with water and we're going to stick it in this side. And then we're going to stick the serum separator with the blood on this side. And then, same thing with the lavender. We have a lavender filled with water. You put that on that side, and we'll put the lavender on this side. And you close it tightly, and you're going to spin it down. You press the blood button, and it spins, spins for five uh, minutes. Press start, and it spins. Okay. Moving the lavender top with a um, hemostat so you don't remix the plasma with the, with the blood. And I'm just going to place it into here. And then we're going to take out the serum separator as well. And then we're going to place in the um, recipient's blood, uh, ethyl. And we're going to place it the same way, evenly. And then we're going to put it on blood and start it and spin it for five minutes as well. Good. We're going to remove the serum. Um, this is the donor tube for Ruby. And we're going to stick the serum in a red top tube. So we'll just take all the serum out. And we're going to place that all into the regular red top. Okay, and we'll put that to the side, and then we're going to do the same thing for the uh, recipient, Ethel. This is her tube. Using the syringe. Okay, we're going to take the serum out. And place that into this tube. And we will put that to the side for 
later. And now we're going to decant the plasma out of the lavender top tubes. So this is the plasma here. Okay, so we only have the, um, the erythrocytes in there now, and we're going to place two drops. Um, this is, this is um, Ruby's erythrocytes, the recipient. We're going to place two drops of those into a new tube. fill the rest of this vial up with sodium chloride. And we'll gently mix it. Spin that down. We're going to do the same thing for ethyls. take two drops of the erythrocytes out of ethyls and stick it into a new container as well. And what we're doing is basically washing the erythrocytes. And then we're going to fill this as well. Christy? Hold on, I'll call you right back. It's your mama three. You want me to try to call you back? Yes. Okay. Okay, and then we're going to mix that and we're going to spin both of them down for about one minute at 3400 RPM. Yeah, I was looking for a high room menu actually. Not for me. Alright, so we're going to spin these down. Same thing as last time. You're going to do it evenly one on this side, one on this side. Close it and spin it for one minute. The second wash, um, we're going to remove the supernatin. This is Ruby's um, erythrocyte wash. So you're going to remove. Anybody order food? Yeah. It's here. Okay. Hey there, can you get my wallet? You can stop it, okay. Do another wash. Um, so you're going to remove the super natant off of the top. And then once that's removed, you're going to go ahead and put um, more saline to the top and re spin it down so that you know that the erythrocytes are completely washed. So that's completely empty, so we're going to go ahead and fill 
pop the syringe with some more sodium chloride. Pop that. Okay, so that one's ready to be spun down again. We have the um, recipients that we're going to do again. Okay. Sorry, I don't have a syringe big enough to fit in this vial, but it sucks it out more than one. One more time, we're going to fill this one up, and then we're going to spin them down, and then remove the red blood cells, and stick them in another vial. Okay. So, we're going to spin these down, so we're going to place these in the center feed. for one minute. I'm going to um, do the erythrocyte suspension now. This is um, Ruby's, the donor. We're going to remove the supernatin off of the top. And then we're going to place 0.2 ml of the erythrocytes and 0.98 sodium chloride into another vial and that will be the erythrocyte suspension. It's a very, very small amount, and we have Ruby's um, suspension here. So we're going to go ahead and point the point zero 0.02 in there, and then we're going to put 0.98 in here. You want to make sure you measure it correctly and get all the air bubbles out. Okay, so that's 0.98. I'm going to go ahead and mix that. And that is Ruby, the donor, uh, the donor's erythrocyte suspension, and it's written on there. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing for Ethel, the um, recipient. going to remove the supernatin off. a new syringe and get the erythrocytes with 0 0.02. And that is Ethel, the recipient's erythrocyte suspension. Okay.
Okay, so we're about to do the major cross match. So basically what you do for the major cross match, and we have a vial here that says major cross match, you're gonna take two drops of the recipient serum, which would be ethyl nagel, um, and then you're gonna take two drops of Ruby Rhine, who is the donor of her erythrocyte suspension. You're gonna mix it gently and let it incubate for 30 minutes. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and do that now. Um, so this is Ethel's um, serum, and this is Ruby's erythrocyte suspension. So we have a, a nice clean tube here. So we'll take the serum first. You're going to take a little bit into a syringe and drop two drops into the vial. Okay. And then we are going to take the erythrocyte suspension and a new syringe and you're going to take some of that as well and you're going to drop two drops in. One, two. Okay. Put that back. Mix slightly and allow that to incubate for 30 minutes. For the minor cross match, basically what you're going to do is place two drops of the donor serum and two drops of um, the recipient's erythrocyte um, suspension into a vial. So we're putting the serum in, two drops, new syringe, the erythrocyte suspension, two drops, and you allow that to incubate. Basically for the control vials, you're going to remix the erythrocytes with the serum for each patient. Um, so for um, Ruby, you're gonna go ahead and mix her serum with her erythrocyte suspension. Um, you're gonna put two drops of each into the vials. So this is her erythrocyte suspension. One drop, two drops. You get another syringe for the serum. One drop, two drops. Put the caps back on. Okay. You shake it a little bit, and this is um, Ruby's control. And you're going to go ahead and do the same thing for Ethel. We're going to go ahead and do Ethel's control um, vial, so two drops of her serum, one, two, new syringe, and two drops of her erythrocyte suspension, one, two, okay, tops. and you're gonna let those incubate as well. So all the samples have been incubating for about um, 30 minutes. So we have the minor cross match, um, the major cross match, and the two controls. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and spin them down. Um, and like I discussed before, you always even them out. Um, and you're gonna spin them down at 3400 RPM for about one minute and then we're gonna go ahead and look at the supernatin and figure out whether or not they um, are a match. So after completing the um, cross-matching agglutination test, we have the um, major cross-match and the minor cross-match. As you can see, the supernatin in the major cross-match is red um, and the minor is slightly tinged pink, so these patients are not a match. You need to find another um, donor for the recipient. Okay, these are our control tubes. Um, as you can see, um, they both have um, a clear supernatant, so um, that reveals uh, that there is no autoagglutination. Um, and like I said previously, the, um, the recipient's uh, blood um, mixture came back um, with some hemolysis 
and the uh, donors did not, so they still are not a match because um, the supernat needs to be clear in order for it to be um, a match. We're going to do a skin scrape on um, Barney. He has a whole bunch of skin lesions going on, and we're not totally sure what they are. Um, normally, we do skin scrapings on dogs to look for different types of mites, uh, demodectic mites, uh, sarcoptic mange, um, stuff like that. But we're going to do one on Barney because we have him here. So you need a little bit of mineral oil, and you're going to put it on the, the slide. And you use a 10 blade, and you get some of the oil on the blade and I'm wearing gloves just for precaution so because you're not totally sure what the animal has and you're gonna scrape in a vertical motion and you wanna do it deep enough so you get a nice sample A lot of the times um, when you're looking for mites, you want to make them actually bleed because you know that you're getting deep enough. So we have a sample on there. We're going to stick it on the slide. We'll get a little bit more just in case. And then when you're done, you can apply some ointment to the area so that it um, brings down the inflammation. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. So now we're going to bring this to the microscope and look at it under um, the microscope. Okay. Okay. So we're going to be looking at the um, the skin scraping slide under the microscope. Um, so you look at it in the hundredth power because you don't want to go too small because um, what you're normally looking for on skin scrapings is uh, mites, scabies, um, stuff like that. And normally you'd see stuff like that on dogs. Um, but again, we did our slide on a cat. Um, so you always focus um, in the lower power first. So he's been pretty itchy, he's licking a lot, um, and we're not totally sure what's going on with him, but I'm in the hundredth power now looking, and it doesn't really look like he has any um, mites of any sort. Um, we previously did a cytology on him and um, we saw some mast cells and some eosinophil so we're thinking he might have um, some sort of an allergic reaction to either he's on insulin he just was started on the new insulin um, so potentially that or uh, a food allergy of some sort.